Hi everyone. So let's get started with this second part where we're gonna talking about we're gonna be talking about cones, um, which is a really useful geometrical structure in the context of LPs and and the notion of extreme rays, which is connected with the notion of unbounded problems. We're also gonna use the notion of cones to relate to the Farkas lemma, which is a uh, a theoretical result that allows us to have certificates of infeasibility for linear programs. So let's start by first, you know, clearly defining what we mean by cone. So um, a cone is, it, we talked about these sets before. Uh, they basically mean that they are these sets where when you pick elements from the set and then you play with scaling them with non-negative scales, um, all these elements also belong to the set. So let me make a, make a drawing here. Suppose this is the origin. So this is zero. And then I suppose I have like x1, I have x2, and I have, I don't know, x3, x3. And I'm thinking of what I'm doing with them when I scale them with non-negative scalars. Basically what I'm doing is moving them all the way to the origin and beyond. So this with that, this with that, and this with this, right? So if you, you can see that if that is true, with all the elements in this set, it, with all the elements in C, what you're going to end up with is this sort of, you know, if you pick all the points between, say, x1 and x2, you get all the points there in this element. So that's why cone, you know, that's why it represents, it's called a cone, because it kind of looks, you know, two, you know, three, it does look like a cone, like an ice cream cone. And because we are talking about um, a non-negative scalars, you'll see that unless this set is empty, I don't have any points to do this play with, um, the, my uh, z zero, the origin is gonna be part of the set. So it's kind of like a, you know, just like linear, uh, because it's, you know, it sort of relates to linear combinations, uh, but disregarding the negative part. So just like when you talk about say subspaces that are generated by linear combinations, you know, doing conic combinations also, have this notion that is is present in the origin. And we say when that is such, that the cone, cone is, is pointed. Um, for us, an important cone is going to be those of that are called polyhedral cones. And polyhedral cones are defined just like we define polyhedral sets, and it's represented by the intersection of a collection of half spaces, um, um, but with this different right-hand side. So they kind of look like such. So I have a picture here. Um, so this is R3, and they have one half space, two half space, and there is one at the back that you can see A3 because it's pointing outwards. Um, I realize if you look at the slides, you can see that there is a there is a better picture showing also the continuity here. It's just showing well on the screen. I'm sorry for that. But have a look at the slides and you will see. Uh, it's a very faint gray showing that you have a facet that is this, a facet that is this, and a third facet at the back. And uh, when I look at greater than or equal than zero these things, this is a cone that has a, a, if I cut it perpendicular, I would see like a triangle sitting here. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a polyhedral cone and defined like such. Right. Um, this is um, this is basically a, a corollary from um, theorem. Um, I don't think it's theorem eight. It's theorem five from lecture three. Is that theorem that we proved that um, if we didn't we didn't actually give gave a proof of that I gave you like a picture to as an interpretation. Is the one that says that if you have a extreme point, you can't have a line. And if you have extreme points, you must have n uh, linearly independent vectors uh, among the the a um, the ai vectors forming the forming the polyhedral set. Um, so that's basically you know with the bearing in mind that a polyhedral cone is a polyhedral set, then this that holds for a polyhedral set must hold for a polyhedral cone. So proving this is is sort of trivial. We just apply what is going on on theorem 
um, on theorem five from lecture three, um, directly theorem f uh, three, well, you can say it's 3.5, the first one means lecture, um, to the polyhedral set uh, C, right? Um, and because C, um, a polyhedral cone is a polyhedral set, and as we define polyhedral sets, polyhedral sets are convex, then C is obviously convex. And with that notion of convexity of C, you can actually show that um, zero, the point uh, of the pointed cone, is actually going to be the only extreme point of, the, of that set. Um, and we can see that by revisiting the definition of extreme point we saw in lecture two, if I'm not mistaken. So grab an X that belongs to that cone, and then say that you generate an X1 by scaling uh, X with lambda one, and then you create an X2 by scaling X with a lambda two different than lambda one. But you do it in a way that when you add lambda one and lambda two, uh, it's half. So that could be like two thirds and one third. I said it can be different, but just for the sake of visualization, you could also have half in here, half in here, and it would be the same. Um, clearly, because of the way we're defining cones, um, X1 is gonna belong to the cone and X2 are gonna belong to the cone. So you just found two points belonging to the set for which the convex combination of them generates X. And that's exactly the the what you can't do if x is an extreme point. It's that story that um, you know for x to be an extreme point, you can't find two points in a set for which it's a convex combination. But in in a in the cone, you know, if you pick a point x one and a point x two, x two, which is just the scalings of x, this will always belong to the set. So that's that's kind of how it goes. That would be your only chance to find a uh, a, a vertex. Um, so that's it. Um, the reason why we're defining cones and, and polyhedral cones is because there is an important uh, concept associated with uh, actually recession cones, which is a type which is a type of a polyhedral cone that has a practical interpretation in the context of a problem P. So um, let, let my, my polyhedral set uh, P be defined like so. So one important detail is that I am encapsulating any non-negativity constraint associated with X within the matrix A. So my matrix A has that form that is my A and I have my identity plugged below it and that's greater and equal than B and then vector of zeros here. So I'm looking into this sort of shape, okay? Um, so if I do look like so, I all can say that the recession cone um, at X bar is given uh, at X bar which is a, a element of the set P, is given by all the directions D for which when I move from X bar towards D with, there is something missing here, with a non-negative um, lambda, I still remain in the set P. See? So basically, uh, the recession cone of P is the cone formed by all these directions um, th that if I go infinite and beyond, I am still within the set P. So if you, if you distribute this, multiply here and multiply there, you will get a B here that you can move to the other side and cancel these out. So you get lambda A D, and because the lambda is a constant that you know is greater or equal than zero, you can simply say that this whole plot is actually this. And this, it makes it more obvious that it's a polyhedral code, just like we defined, right? So it's all the, this, it's all the directions um, that, that for which this is true. Um, or you can see that it's the intersection 
of of the directions that have a uh, form 90 degrees with each of the rows of a um so here is a picture kind of showing what is the what it, what, what are these recession cones um so this is my polyhedral set p like so and then what i'm looking at is uh, directions that I can go indefinitely without leaving the polyhedral set P. And the polyhedral set P here extends, extends to infinity and beyond. So you can see that, say here, this direction, which is kind of parallel to this, which is parallel to this, uh, I can go infinity and beyond. Any direction in the middle here would also work the same way. And this direction, which is parallel to that, and then that's basically it. If I go in this direction, I would eventually hit this. If I go at this direction, I will eventually hit that. And any direction this way, I will eventually hit this. And you can see that the, the recession cone doesn't really depend on x. I mean, it works if, you, if you're thinking about directions here, if you think of directions here, and you're thinking about directions there, okay? And uh, so, so these directions, that you can go forever is something that is called a ray. Uh, so a ray is a direction D within a polyhedral set that you can move on forever without leaving the, the set. So it's one of those Ds for which this is true. So a directions D that belong to the recession cone. These are rays. Um, and uh, so if you're, just a, a remark is that if you had your P written as a standard form, so, so with equalities and then your X conditions separately, then this is equivalent at, at simply having, you know, equality here and likewise imposing component-wise non-negativity on your direction Ds. Right. So, th so this is the, the notion of, of having uh, your recession code. And uh, the reason why you're interested in these recession cones, it's because some of these rays are more important than others. I mean, so you have these rays, but you have this ray, and this is a very important ray. Oh, this ray, that is also a very important ray. And these are the ones we define as extreme rays. It sounds like the 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 special ability of a villain or something. The extreme ray, um, and what is the extreme ray? It's basically the 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 generalization of the notion of extreme point for a structure that is only composed by rays. So a polyhedral cone is just a is just a like a, a bundle of rays, right? And then you're looking at those that are at the surface when um, n minus 1 of the polyhedros, uh, the, the facets, are, are touching. And that's exactly it. So um, a non-zero vector in this cone is, a, is called an extreme ray if at there you have n minus 1 active constraints. So that's a bit curious because there's this minus one here. We'll talk about that in a second, but it's that is the case. So uh, if a polyhedral cone in R three, the extreme ray is that where you have n minus one two polyhedrals touching. Because you're talking about the, the minus one comes from because you're talking about rays. You don't talk about vertices. Vertices will need three points, uh, three hyperplanes intercepting. But for cones, because you want a ray, you need two. So it's a line instead of a dot. So revisiting that picture we had, um, this cone has three extreme rays. Uh, extreme ray, so this is extreme ray. This is extreme ray, because I have, so this has the back poly, the back facet and this facet meeting. This one has this facet and the back facet meeting. Um, this and this one has this, this facet and this facet meeting. N minus one, two, two, and two. There you go. 
three extreme rays. Any 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 D inside this uh, polyhedral ice cream cone, a three faced ice cream cone, would be a array. But these are the interesting ones because they are what we call extreme rays. And uh, so when we say that we have a extreme ray of the recession cone of P, instead of saying this mouthful, we just say the extreme ray of P and P being a polyhedral set. Okay. Um, we say the extreme rays are equivalent if they are just scalars, uh, is, you know, scalar of the multiplications of D. So this is an extreme ray and this is the same extreme ray. Let me, so we can say that this is lambda 1 d1 and this is lambda 2 d1 and these are exactly the same extreme ray, okay? So we have, we have an x extreme ray for each pair of active constraints in this case. So, and because it is defined like so, it automatically gets this combinatorial nature just like we had before. And that means that we always have a finite number of extreme rays in polyhedral sets, in polyhedral codes. Because you have a finite number of those. You have a finite number of folds. All right. Um, so this leads us to these two theorems that show how we can connect to the notion of extreme rays and um, polyhedral sets. So basically what we do is first we're going to look into polyhedral codes because then it's easier um, to, to derive it um, to extreme uh, to polyhedral sets directly. So we can use the existence of extreme rays to check whether a problem is unbounded or not. So let's start with polyhedral cones. Um, let us assume that we're trying to minimize a problem that can write, be written like so, where our constraint set is actually a polyhedral cone, just like we defined before. Um, the optimal value of that problem P is going to be minus infinity if and only if you can find extreme ray D satisfying this condition. So you can find a extreme ray that forms an angle um, greater than 90 degrees with the that of the coefficients of the objective function. So basically what it's saying is that you can find a, a extreme ray, a ray that goes beyond an inf infinity and beyond, that is opposite to C, meaning that it is in aligned with minus C and then it can go to infinity to improve the objective function. So the Proof is, is is it's a bit technical, but it's it's okay. Let's go through it. Um, so if this is the case, then obviously P is unbounded because this is going to minus infinity along D. So you can just go in that direction, and the problem is unbounded in, uh, indeed. Um, but let's let's just say that we stop at some point in that ray that is going to infinite, and pick that number in a way that we can scale it, this thing to be minus one. Um, so, you know, j just because we have a constant and and we'll make it such that that constant is minus one. Um, so, by doing so, what we can do is um, let let us look at our problem our polyhedral set now being defined as the original polyhedral cone but i also have this additional constraint that's saying that c transpose x is minus one that that is basically in that polyhedral cone i had before um let me do this a bit more like so what i'm saying is that i'm coming and doing a you know i'm picking a level and doing a cone that so I get this extra facet constraint not facet but like cutting it perpendicularly that would be the constraint C transpose X equals minus one so I'm adding another constraint to it because I know that zero this cone is pointed I can use that I can use that theorem um, that we just looked into that show that um, I have uh, n 
linearly independent vectors, and we know that n independent vec linearly independent vectors is spun Rn, and that's the theorem I ate in lecture three. Um, I think it's actually theorem five in lecture three. Um, theorem five in lecture three. So um, let's just pick one one d um, being one of those extreme points. Okay. Um, so so basically, what what this is saying is that this set is gonna have extreme points, and I'm picking one of those, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. Um, at this point, we have n um, linearly independent active constraints, which are n minus one of those original constraints, plus the additional constraint that is cutting it transversely. So if you think of, of let's say oh, my, my D is this one, I have as active constraint, the constraint on, you know, cutting the cone transversely, and then this facet and the back facet. So n minus one constraints of the original polyhedral, the con the conical the, the polyhedral cone set. Polyhedral conical, the cone, the set that is a polyhedral cone, and plus this additional constraint, which is the trans transversal cut. And therefore, we just, you know, that's exactly the definition of extreme ray. It's it's a direction D such such that this is observed uh, and and you have n minus one active constraints. So there you go. So if you have an extreme ray, your problem is unbounded. Um, if your feasible set is a polyhedral cone. And now what we're gonna do is prove it, generalize it for polyhedral sets which is a bit more involved and now we need duality to help us with that, but it's also not too, too complicated. So basically what's going on here then is that, so let us, let our problem be defined like such with X just being our polyhedral set defined in this sort of general form. And um, let us assume that the feasible set has at least one extreme point, otherwise there's no fun. Um, then the optimal value is going to be minus infinity, meaning that the problem is unbounded, only if and only if um, you can find a direction D for which it is out. Um, and that's, that's you know, the, di the general definition of unboundedness. So in order to do that, let's, the, the way in which we observe this first we can easily show unboundedness because you know once again you can just carry on on that direction forever and and improve your objective function. Now, if you think of the dual of this this original problem P, which is this, it looks like that, right? You you can work out this now. You can see that you have variables irrestricted in sign and a greater than equal than constraint in a minimization. So here is a non-negative variable and a quality constraint. So we also saw before that if P is unbounded, that means that D is infeasible, right? We proved that. And if D is infeasible for this being in B, it also gonna be infeasible with this B being zero. Um, because I'm not changing the, feas the feasible region at all, okay? And now, if I go back and use my self-dual trick and go back to my primal problem associated with this dual, I get a primal that looks like this. Oh, you can see that this is actually, you know, not how we define polyhedral codes, but that will mean that this primal, because this duo is infeasible, with an infeasible duo, when you look at the primal, your primal different from, from the direction where the first is unbounded. If the first is infeasible, the, the duo, the, if the primal is infeasible, the duo can be infeasible or unbounded. So when we do this flip from the duo to the primal, now we have, because we know that this is, a, is a infeasible, um, the primal can either be unbounded or infeasible, 
But we just by inspecting, we know if we plug zero here, this thing is feasible. So it's not infeasible. The problem with this is that it is unbounded. Um, now, so this is an unbounded problem. And we know that the existence of at least one extreme point in P will mean that these rows spawn Rn. And that a recession cone can be written like so. Uh, which can be written like so, sorry, is, is pointed. And now that this is a, now that this thing is proved to be pointed, we can come back and use theorems five to show that there is the direction D for which this is the case. So basically the trick is um, we reduce the original polyhedral set by an equivalent polyhedral cone. By, by using the notion of duality and the relationship between infeasible duals and, and uh, unbounded, infeasible primals and unbounded duals. Well, unbounded primals and infeasible duals, that when we do duality again, then we end in a situation that we have to figure whether it's infeasible or unbounded. And in this case, we can know it is unbounded because we have a feasible point, so it's not infeasible. So I think that's the, the complication that comes from this. But basically what we just proved is that then there is there is indeed a um um P being P being unbounded implies the existence of that direction. Um so this is relevant in the context of of optimization um of linear programming specifically because you can obtain these extreme rays. Uh, whenever you find an unbounded problem. So suppose you solve your model and then your model returns, you know, your problem is unbounded. You can automatically also give get the actual direction towards, it, towards it, which this is unbounded. And that can be useful, say, um, you know, to generate a constraint to remove that direction or even to analyze your model and see if there is anything wrong with it in terms of formulation. So the way to get that is actually simple. So if your problem is written like so, standard form, and then you have a, a basis B for which you found the optimal value being minus infinity. Um, so basically what's happening in terms of simplex method is that we found this non-basic variable X with a negative reduced cost. But then when you look at the columns of B, B minus one A, you're trying to do your co co quotient ratio, the ratio test. Uh, there's no positive coefficients there. So your your vector u, remember, this vector u, it's you can't find anyone to use as a as a uh, as a denominator in the test. So that means that it's an unbounded problem. Um, and from that, what you can do then is say, well, my db is going to be my my minus b minus one aj. So this is my direction. Remember that this db is the symmetric of the u. So these are, are positive when these are because of this minus. Um, that non-basic variable is the one that gets my one and everything else gets zero. And that direction here is going to be a direction that is an extreme ray. To show that is not that complicated at all. Um, we simply have to, um, there's an e missing here we simply have to see the following. We know that this is the case by construction because of the way we derived this. Um, so if this feasibility is guaranteed. Um, and we know that this is the case as well. Um, well, we know that all of these things are non-positive. Non they are zero or negative. And putting the minus in front, so they become non-negative. So this is also true, and then the other ones are one and zero. So D belongs to the recession cone of that when I just make this zero. Um, and there are n minus one active constraints um, at D, being those um, basically n constraints coming from this. Then you have the extra n minus m non-basic variables that you're making all zero but one. So n minus n minus one variable is being forced to zero. So you have these and these active. So we do have n minus one active constraint. So it is indeed an extreme direction. And because of that, 
uh, even when you're sim solving your simplex method and you happen to reach a unbounded problem, from the last basis you visited, that one that you realize to be a um, uh, the basis at which you realize that your problem was unbounded, you can get the extreme ray for that basis. And it's nowadays, uh, solvers like Cplex and Gorobi, uh, they can easily return you a unbounded ray in case you found a unbounded solution. This has an implication for when we look into the development of something that is called the Bender's decomposition later on as well. Um, the last thing to look at is the notion of um, Farkash lemma. So Farkash lemma is a theoretical result that allows us to um, inquire about the feasibility of a given LP. And we can use that, uh, we can use linear LP duality to um, to give a certificate whether we can you can assert that a problem is infeasible. This is especially useful in contexts where you're solving problems that are so hard that is sometimes it's even hard to you know try to build a feasible solution, you know find a solution that satisfies all the system of equations. So one way that can be done is you know look into uh, use Farkash lemma to see if you can generate a certificate of infeasibility because if you can, then you can prove that there is no feasible solution to that system at all. So there is no use expending computational power to actually find one. So let's look at how this works. Um, look, if you consider these two sets, X and Y, so this is just a polyhedra set and this, you know, looks a lot like the dual but not quite. Um, so basically what we can see here very trivially is that if you can find a P that satisfies this condi these conditions, then you won't be able to find an X that satisfies the conditions above. Because if there is a P for which this is true, then there is no way that you can find, so you can see that P A X is must be different than P B. And you know, if you just remove P, you, you're observing that this has to be different than that. And a condition for X to be in the set above is that they actually have to match, be the same. They have to be equal to that. So they are they are mutually they are, they are defining sets that are that have no intersection. So if you you know if you have an element in this set, you can have an element in that set and vice versa. And that P is exactly the certificate of infeasibility that you would use. And that is what is behind. Um, the Farkash theorem that is at the bottom here. So you have this n by n matrix and, and this n vector, and then you can say that exactly one of the following statements can hold. You either have there exists some x0 for each that's true, or you can find a vector p for which this is the case. Um, the proof is, is, is rather simple. Um, we just did the first part. So if you assume that one is satisfied, then you can see immediately that two is violated by the derivation we did before. Now to show two, um, so you you have to use primal, you know, primal dual, primal and dual, so primal dual pairs. Um, so define your primal like the thing you saw at the top. And if you look at the dual or that problem, it looks actually like this. And um, because P is infeasible, we know that D must be unbounded or infeasible. Um, and because that, um, but because we know that we can plug P equals zero here, because this is a pointed code, um, that means that it has to be unbounded. So this problem is unbounded. If if this problem is unbounded, I can guarantee you that I can find any P, pick a P in that unbounded direction, and that P will be such that this is the case. And that's it. Um, I have a picture here kind of explaining this into a sort of a geometrical standpoint. Um, so if you think about the first system, ax equals b, x greater than or equal than zero. So that was system one. What you would say is that you, thinking of these as the 
lambdas that we've been seeing before, you can basically say is that you can write B as a conic combination or as a combination where these things are non-negative of the column of the vectors from A. Um, so if you have here, say, column A1, column A2, and column A3, and then what you're doing is, you know, trying to see if you can write a vector B, suppose B is that. That is a, some sort of combination of that. If you can, great. But if you can't, suppose B is there. What you're saying is that there is a vector P uh, such that P A is greater or equal than zero and P B is strictly less than zero. So let me show you very quickly this. So yeah, so I'm looking at this. So P A X greater or equal than zero. Uh, I thought there was something missing there. There you go. And this is condition two. So basically what, I'm, what this is telling me is that I can find this P that when I look at the, let's, let's call it Y, this hyperplane, this sits on one side and this vector B sits on the other side. So AX sits on one side and B sits on another side. And that's exactly what this figure is showing. So if B is not inside the code, then I can find a separating hyperplane where B is on one side and this is at the other side. Any, any vector in this code, which is this, is on the other side. So either you can separate them, and if you can separate them, means that you can satisfy this, or B is inside and you can't separate them, so you can't find this condition. So that's kind of like a geometrical way of saying that you can only have one system or another. And this this Farkash lemma, it's um, it's pretty central in in convexity analysis and in optimization. It appears in many contexts, um, and there are also kind of quite a few variations of them. They, they might be written in, in several different forms uh, than it's slightly distinct than that. Uh, but they all are kind of related to the same thing. So basically means that uh, if you are in a situation which you're not entirely sure you can find a solution for that, you can try to figure out whether you can find a P that satisfies these conditions. Uh, because if you can, then it means that you won't be able to satisfy the system at all. Right, so this is a good point for us to stop. Um, the last part, it's gonna be a really short one. We'll just very briefly go over the resolution theorem uh, that involves the representation of polyhedral sets with extreme rays and extreme points. Um, so that's it for now. See you in the last video.